great to be here. And when I mean that, uh, you have no idea. <laughs> I was living in the Middle East for, yeah, sister, you have no idea. Yeah. I was living in the Middle East. I got brought over. So this is what, let me bring you up to speed of how I got back here, besides escaping the Middle East. Yeah. So I got a phone call, and I was having the best job in the world at Cassette, creating amazing experiences for clients like you. But there's one thing in Canada that's always annoyed me, and you probably have this annoying thing bothering you, which is we're built upon legacy systems. Meaning a lot of our technologies, the things you want to change, you can't change. So you're told you can't do this, you can't do that. Which is the worst thing in the world for someone like me, who is a builder. I build experiences. So I got this phone call from Muhammad Alibar, and if those of you that know him, um, amazing if you do, but let me just tell you what he's done. He's the one who built the Burj Khalifa and the Dubai model. So I don't know where he is on the top 20 billionaires, but he's in the top 20. So he said to me that he had invested over a billion dollars, 500 million coming from Saudi and 500 million coming from himself, to recreate the ultimate in e-commerce to go head to head against Amazon. No legacy systems, a fully data-driven experience, best people in the world, all hopped on planes and flew over. I was one. So excited when I got there because I could finally create the ultimate experience without someone telling me, you can't do that because technology won't allow it. So long story short, I spent time in there, I spent time in Saudi. I no issues with the country. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, you work a lot. Uh, you get paid a lot. It, it's quite extraordinary. The downside, obviously, is you're under a different law, share law. You're also, um, you're also really limited in vision. They're very hierarchical in how they think. And so the interesting thing, and I spent a lot of time on self-service and digital. Obviously, I was running the big data group, the UX UI group, the CX group, the CRM group. I had about 47 people reporting to me. And it was an amazing experience. And basically, at the end of my contract, I thought, Time to go home. <laughs> uh, love the food, love all of that. But the one thing about this country that we have is the freedom of choice to make our own decisions. And that's something I didn't really get in the Middle East. So coming back here and putting this deck together for you was really quite interesting. Because I wanted to make sure when I was giving you ideas that it wouldn't be limited by technology. Any technology that you're on right now, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm neutral. I'm all about the fact of Disruption is already happening whether you like it or not, and the stuff that I saw happening in the Middle East was outrageous. I mean, we would be able to deliver a package to you literally as you were walking down the street because we knew exactly where you were at any point in time. The ability to tap data is huge. And so today, uh, wrapping up you know, the intro here of bop, 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 goose, the whole concept is, where does disruption sit? What can you tap into now to help ease the load on your um, customer service ability as well as raise revenue and tighten relationships? Because everything in this world is really about relationships, and I think we all agree to that. Technology is not replacing it, but it is replacing some things. Google was announcing and creating lists, and do you know the first career that's going to get wiped out in five years? Hopefully no one has a spouse in this, but might want to switch careers right now. Accountants, they're on the ticking, t like, between all of the technology and the fact that now we're going to be able to scan things automatically and everything's going to be digitized, the ability for an accountant to sit down and do things for you is going to become obsolete. So if you're in accounting school, probably a good idea to switch. So let's look and talk about where we're going to wrap up today. It's really about a customer-centric point of view. Help me, know me, but value me. And that doesn't mean bombing people with emails. It doesn't mean uh, asking the same question twice. It means honing in on these top 10 things. And I, I didn't put them in order of priority. I put them somewhat in order of things you should do as you're getting down the list. If you haven't done the first ones, I recommend you kind of play in that space. It's really about being preemptive. You need to be on the offensive, not defensive. You need to be implementing some of these tools because other companies who are starting from scratch, who are coming head to head against exactly what you do, are already in play and already in market. The good news is there are a lot of tools that you can leverage that they're producing, and B, 
both assisted self-service, which means you're helping someone along with very various methods, or unassisted meaning they're on your web or mobile experience and doing it themselves. But all of them require one thing, is that you have to think ahead, because none of this is going to get on your experience or be optimized without you thinking forward. So, really it's about time to win. I don't want to freak anyone out as we're going to start to talk a little bit about some of this technology. It's a really a good thing. Don't be uh, scared of it. But what we all know is that everything revolves around the customer. And this is why I say don't be scared. I don't know if anyone can see this. Up on the left is a little tweet. <laughs> and it's from, I don't know if anyone remembers it. I laugh, I can't even get to the story. I apologize. I feel like Jerry Seinfeld laughing at my own stuff. But, Microsoft launched a bot. I don't know if anybody remembers this. And they, they didn't tell anyone, and they launched it on Twitter. And this bot, and a bot is basically an artificial intelligence um, communication tool. So it's run by algorithms. So it's not a real person. It's not pre-programmed. In other words, if you say yes, I say this. If you say no, I say this. It's unscripted. And they were sly about it. And they put it up on the internet. And bots learn from people. They communicate by what you say to me and how you respond. I tap into your psychology if I'm a bot as an algorithm. So it started off quite innocent. And it really is one of those freakish things that can go real bad, real fast. Microsoft owned it. But in the beginning, let's read this little tweet. It says, that, can I just say that I'm super stoked to meet you. Humans are super cool. That's quite innocent. Then people started responding to the bot, and based upon the language that you used to the bot, the bot started picking up that language and throwing it back. Not in the exact language, but morphing it. So within less than an hour, Microsoft's secret bot turned into, uh, chill, I'm a nice person, I just hate everyone. Then it turned into, I hate feminists, they should all die and burn in hell. Then it turned into, less than 24 hours, Hitler was right, I hate all the Jews. 24 hours in the top brands in the world, less than a year ago. And then basically, you know, the capture from someone was, you know, Tay, the bot, went from, hey, humans are super cool, to full Nazi, less than 24 hours. Really, I'm concerned about the future of AI. Well, yeah. So, and there were much more graphic things if you ever want to read the trail, but this thing went off on its own so quickly. So they took it down and they tried again and the same thing happened. Twice. So was it a failure? I don't know. You know, you look at, um, we have a new AI center building in Toronto, one of the top ones in the world. They're bringing all the scientists here. There's a lot of future in it and there's a lot of future in bots. But right now, we're going to talk about the top 10 things that you can do. Some are way easy, some are a little more difficult. But the good news is, is they're all possible. Most of them don't even require you to code anything, which I'm a big fan of, because I can't code a single thing. So let's move on. KPIs. I'm just warming you up. If you're not tracking or writing down your KPIs, then we've got a problem. And it still, it still shocks me where people need to understand there are certain KPIs you should be tracking moving forward starting today. And it's really simple. From a customer experience point of view, omni-channel, meaning for your customers who are online, those who are online, they only do business with in, in person, you need to be tracking uh, net promoter score, NPS. If you're not tracking NPS, then you haven't even made a pass number pick. So let's assume you look at all of them. Who's tracking NPS? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's not tracking NPS? Okay, no one wants to admit it. But look, the good news is, is NPS is a simple, simple score. It's not the end all and be all. It's a little question you can get. Um, you can sign up with a company, like there's a company called Delighted, and it's a tiny little face. And you can add it to your emails at the end, delighted. It's like really hip, cheap software, plugs and plays into everything. And it's simply on the scale of one to 10, how, it asks your customer, how likely are you to recommend and insert your company name or service to a friend or colleague? And you're looking for a score, because there are actual benchmark scores. This used to be used to determine loyalty, propensity to churn or leave you 
to go to someone else. And most of us are tracking NPS, and you can get them, it works on mobile, it can work as a, a survey, and really, the score is one to 10, how likely you are. And when you're sitting up in the nine to tens, those are your promoters, those are people who talk really highly of you, and those people are amazing. That's who you should spend time with as well, because they're gonna promote you. So they're the ones you wanna go after for testimonials, they're the ones that uh, you really want to nurture if you have special events or, or things like that. Now your passives are seven and eight to give you seven and eight. Seven and eight score sounds pretty darn good, but these aren't the guys who are really promoting you. These are the guys who are sitting on the fence. And then you got the distractors, anyone under six, which is pretty aggressive if you think about it. But what that is saying is that these guys are more likely to churn. Spend time with them, yes, but there is a good point of trying to grow your business. Now, NPS is really interesting because you just take the total score and you basically take the best average and minus and you end up with uh, a benchmark. Now, Delighted is great because it plots everything for you and you can look and see uh, certain segments and, and wonderfulness. But overall, what you need to be concerned about is the industry. This image here shows you where the insurance industry is sitting on an NPS score. So your score should be sitting in the range of, where is it, 19 to 68 with an average of 37 out of 100. That's not that great, no? No, it's not that great. Don't worry, telecom is way worse. Like, there are some companies like computer and tablets, you can see fast food, a lot of them. But the, the really good people, like auto dealers, who are creating this long-standing relationship, look at NPS. Now, NPS is a great score, super cheap, throw it up. You can use surveys yearly. We do them quarterly in our business. I'll do them with um, students I teach. I'll do them with clients. I'll do them with everyone so I can see where, how satisfied people are and refer. Now, it's not the end all and be all because things always go bad, no matter who you are. And that's where the customer effort score is. And I'm a big fan of this one for your industry and for us in e-commerce and delivery when you order something from Amazon same day. I think I've done it like 30 times and it's arrived twice, actually on time on same day. So the question becomes, what is customer effort score? It's a simple question where you ask the person, and I've got this recorder for you, how much effort did you personally have to uh, put forth to handle your request. And the reason why this is important, and if those of you remember my slides last year, people are lazy. <laughs> people are really lazy. Like if you've ever watched television and you didn't can find the remote, and you're like, this is the worst show ever, but yet you're not moving because you don't know where the remote is. I know it's happened to all of us. You're really praying for something good to come on because you're not moving. Effort score means that I was able to self-serve myself or it was super easy dealing with you. This is another question you can tag on the end of your emails on big milestones like you signed up with us, you renewed with us, you changed your address with us, and you had a problem and we fixed it, hopefully fixed it. So NPS and customer effort score, two of the things that you should be tracking now because if you have them as your benchmark, You'll now see if 987654321 strategies and tactics are working for you and making you a better person to do business with. Does anyone have any questions on those two things? Because they're super simple things you can implement online, offline, get the baseline going. And all the top companies are doing, oh, well, this is very aggressive. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It was a bit to do. All right. So there was a great list for your industry on how to lose a customer. Instead of doing it the opposite, I'm like, here's how to lose a customer. Bounce around talking to different people, making you repeat myself over and over again, even if it's just my address or if it's something. And I know that these slides will be available later so you can keep your list to make sure you go down. Not knowing what my options are is another reason I, as a customer, will leave you. Meaning if I only feel like one option and it's not really the right one for me, there's a good chance I'm gonna be looking around. If I have to do the company work for you, like the time that I basically, me and Twitter are probably not best friends, 
Sephora was having this contest and I went to sign up for it and it wasn't working at all for Canadians. So I found it faster to go to Twitter and say, hey guys, just letting you know that your contest for Canadians isn't working, I can't register properly. And she said, do you mind emailing our customer service department? I was like, oh, yes I do, because I'm, and this is a full trail that's on public, right? Because I'm telling you now, because you work there, it's probably faster than me logging something that's gonna get pushed. So don't make me do your work for you, that's never a good thing. Also, you know, telling people what you already know, pouring through opaque documentation. Okay, no offense, insurance companies, you guys and, and brokers have been redesigning uh, everything from invoices to all the stuff that comes with it. I know to make it easier to read. You're never really going to get there. Like, let's just be honest. Like, sometimes you just need to. I need to talk to someone. A bot can't help me with this. I'm like, I really don't understand what you're saying. You'll repeat the sentence to me, and I'm like, nope, still not getting it. Still not getting it. So, you know, people understand as well as we explain, which is an interesting uh, way to put it. Uh, so watch your documentation. Multiple places for information. There's <laughs> having a website with like a, an FAQ section or customer service where they can go and then very simple and simple language find things is a rarity these days, and that's something we'll talk about as well. Also, make sure you know um, if I get resolution or not. And that's why that customer effort score is so great. If your customer effort score is super high and no one gets resolution, how else are you knowing? Because people are like, bare, uh, people don't often say things to you. It's called back talk. They'll say it about you, behind you. But it's rare, people don't want confrontation. They like the ostrich. They'd rather stick their head in the sand and butt <clears> somewhere, <throat> pretend everything's okay. Then they'll just, when it comes time to look for another broker or someone, they'll, they'll look on the slide. So we want to be cool about that. Findability with a hanging line. <laughs> so findability is the, the number nine thing. And this is a bunch of things. This goes to your site, to your mobile, to your URL, to your Twitter, to all of the things. People are lazy again. I'm not going to hunt you down. I don't have the time. So we better make sure that you are putting the right information at the right spot in the right time. And I'm trying not to give you any homework to do, but this guy is probably one of the most popular things right now. And I was telling uh, some people I work with, it's funny, you can get a job now just doing this. Like all the banks are hiring customer journey people. And all you do is look at different segments and how they access different touch points for different questions. And you map it. So what you'll notice though, and this is difficult to see, this is actually for uh, an insurance vertical. If you look at the top across, it's kind of the funnel of, I need something, I'm researching, I'm selecting, I'm purchasing, I'm receiving, I'm using, I'm maintaining, and then I'm hopefully recommending. So those are the phases. But I don't use the same technology for everything, nor in person. On the left hand side, is agent web, call center, going top to bottom, mobile device, email, repair shop, that's usually do. In this case, I think we're talking about automotive uh, insurance in particular, and social. And what you'll notice if you start to track where your customers are going, they need different information in different formats at different points in time. So this is a great exercise to do for yourself if you're gonna launch something and it's, it's not spray and pray as we call it in the industry. Don't throw it everywhere. Maybe it is just an email. Maybe it's just a piece of paper. Maybe it's mail that they need. But unless you really understand your audience of what they're doing when, you're going to have a difficult time. So this is actually a great way to hold on to and map out as it's changing. Um, customer journey maps are amazing. Now, Mint. So we're still in findability. So. Okay, you need to know where to go for customer service for, for different things. Got it, so we covered that. And you're tracking your, your KPIs now, so you're good. So we're tracking, we know where people are going, but to self-serve, you kind of have to have an area, hopefully, beyond, that is a secure state where someone can go in. Because if you list the top 10 things that someone's gonna wanna do with you, I guarantee you, going to be looking at some of their policy information. It's going to be possibly changing address, changing credit card, changing certain things that are secure. So if you're what we call onboarding, your sign up process 
to get into your secure area is cumbersome or too many questions because you want to know your customer more, you're going to lose them. Mint is a great, it's a finance, uh, online financial institution that really is um, all about modern, again, no legacy systems. But what they've nailed down is a secret formula, and it's not that hard. If you have an onboarding process where someone signs up and obviously has to have their account information with them, make sure you tell them what they need. Please have your account information. And then always give them three to four bullet points what they will get when they sign up, the benefits. You'll be able to access real-time 24-7, X, Y, Z, change this, do that. What, without benefits, there's no reciprocal relationship because now I'm doing your job for you. It's kind of like going to the fast food place, which I'm kind of offended by now. And they're like, here, fill up your own soda. And you're like, wow, like, didn't I just pay for you to fill up my soda? But now it's everything's about self-serve. And that's a good thing. But we need to make sure they can get in. They, we need to know the value. So less is more. Ask more questions when they're in the profile. You want to onboard smoothly as many people as possible. And if you can send them a link that gets them in there faster, even better. Findability. Anyone got a question on that one? Less is more. So the self-service area for personalized service of top-notch tasks, like changing things, adding things, updating. And it's really about empowerment, convenience, and engagement. Three really simple things, but it's allowing me to get the tools I need, the calculators, the article. Those don't need to be secure, but I need to know where I can get those. Even if they're not yours, you can still link to other ones because you're showing value and you're helping me. Understanding that I don't want to wait in line, I don't want to do this, this is the thing. You can now have a 24-7 offering. Everybody is 24-7 fully transparent. You can thank people like Uber, where you can see exactly where everybody's going. Everything now is based upon the guy's best in class. Nobody goes, well, this insurance company does it this way, or this bank. They don't. They're like, I don't understand. If Uber can show me where this is, why can PureLater not tell me where my package is? Like, it, it's insane. We're all getting sort of um, decommissioned in the old ways. So engagement, you put on multiple tools that also allow neat things for people. Now, one of the cheapest, fastest things to do, and I can't tell you how many times I get in arguments about this, and it, it's, it's insane. FAQs are frequently asked questions. Having an FAQ as a primary navigation item, people are like, oh, no one's going to go there. It always ends up to be the top place people go. Your search is only as good as your back end, so you might not have the best search. But you probably, in your head, can list five things that people constantly ask you so annoyingly so they're like, oh, like, you're a robot. So take those, put them on frequently asked questions, put the button right up at the top, right on your homepage, right in the footer, have it, they land, it's like the most popular questions, and you can change those. Maybe it changes per season, maybe it just gets updated, maybe you're moving and you put more change address. So having those up front, so easy to do that, um, oops, jump, jump, jump. It's, uh, it's a no-brainer. And so one of the things we always say is if you, which is a tough to see up there, but if you want people to be loyal, there must be no struggle for self-service. Mm -hmm. People are lazy. They get the remote. You're the remote. They're not going to find you. So how do you get the information to them? And we're building up on some of the cooler technologies. We'll get there. But these are kind of the basics, what I call cost to entry. Now, I so those of you who ever use Zendesk, and we used it uh, in the release to tie in our call center, mind you, we were a billion dollar company. Zendesk is super cheap, but the one thing I love about it is it does great automatic uh, FAQ pages. And this template is like the most perfect one to ever mimic because it lists some of the key areas and put knowledge center, support forum, uh, FAQs in there. Now, it's very simple. You look at it, it's got its own search, even though the site has a search, and users can really dig in here. And it looks simple. If it looks complicated, people are going to think that your self-service is complicated. Mm -hmm. Now, the other interesting thing are support forums. I did not put support forums on your list. If we were at a banking, I might talk, I don't know, not even banking, telecom. 
So for those of you, support forums are where you can go in and someone will answer your question, kind of like Amazon, where it's another customer. Unfortunately, in your industry and banking, more so your industry, things are highly confidential, one, highly complicated, and you really don't want Joe Bob from, I don't know, not to make fun of Timmins, but Timmins, you know, releasing advice to some people. Uh, it's just, it's not in the market for you guys, not yet. There are many other tools. So I know that if you look in, on articles of best practice, they'll say, build a community and allow them to engage and answer questions. Your case, I don't recommend it because it's like that bot gone mad. You don't want to repeat the Microsoft stuff. You don't want to be watching it every minute by minute. So you're better off to control the experiences that you have. Any questions on FAQ? Super easy. That's good, because our minds are warming you up. <laughs> We're getting there. Key tasks. That was the list I gave you earlier. I said, do you know the top 10 things people want to do on your site? Don't spend money on things people don't want to do. If you haven't asked them, then do a survey, or I'm sure you get the same question. What are the top 10 things people call you for? Write them down. Talk to the people you work with. What are the top 10 things that we constantly get asked? Then you tackle those for FAQs and self-service. It's a really simple thing. So you're looking for online payments, billing information, FAQs, product information. Um, we'll get into IVR and bots and virtual assistants in a second. But community-based service I talked about does exist peer-to-peer, -peer, but I'm not recommending it necessarily for you guys, unless you do something where it relates to your industry. And I'll give you the perfect example. You can do a whole community around how to upgrade your home. You can do a whole thing on home safety. You can do how to be safe, how to winterize your home and be safe in the winter. Great for community, build it up, but stay away from your products and your services in that community. Community still benefit from things like that. Then of course, assisted, which is like online chat, all of these things, social customer service that we'll talk about. But the key is, write out that list. Again, it's another thing that takes you 10 minutes to do and could save you and make you millions and millions of dollars. Okay, so Trove. So now I'm kind of sprinkling in the guys that are out there. Who's heard of Trove? Oh, amazing. So you guys already know this. Trove is really cool. Instead of me telling you, why don't I click the button? So, you've got a few things. A car, camera, couch, home, TV, watch, surfboard, phone. Okay, a lot of things. And some of these things you've had for a few days. Others, a few years. Some things are worth a lot. Others, not so much. But do you have any idea how much it's actually all worth? I mean, you know how much money you have in your bank account. Should you also know how much you have in your living room, garage, and family room? Introducing Trove. The only app that automatically collects and values everything you own. Simply link your inbox to add your email receipts. Use GPS to add your house. Scan a barcode. Search for a product. Or snap a photo. Everything in your trove is given a market value, which you can track over time, so you can make better decisions about the things you own, like knowing the right time to sell your car or home or discovering how much you can get for your old stuff so you can buy something shiny and new or making sure your most valuable items have the insurance coverage they need. All this, just a few taps away on your phone. And with bank level security, rest assured your trove is secure. You control your trove and no one can see it without your permission. Guess there's value in knowing how much your living room is worth, or at least what's in it. Trove, discover the value of everything you own. Download it on the App Store for free today. So Trove is, is an interesting one because it's hitting a human need and, and that human need is really about when things go wrong and you have a fire or burglary or something happens to you, most of us honestly don't have an, like a listing of inventory. I have no idea where my receipts are. Honestly, it's one of these things where no one really wants to spend all that time actually doing all of this. But if you inventory once or you move forward with new things and adding them in there, it's great. What does it mean for you? Well, it means that companies are going out there and finding a need. So if you all of a sudden send me a piece of paper and tell me to log everything and be like, ah, oh, 
when this can take a photo and do all of that. Now the good news is these types of technologies are what's called opening up their APIs, which means they allow you eventually to take in some of their technology, white label it as a route and move forward. But in the meantime, start to think about some of the pains that your customers have. Now this may not be one of the top pain, but there's value in that. When I said show me value, it's like if my broker or my person says, all right, here's, here's a tool suite just for you, um, because I know X, Y, Z. It could be because you have a pool and it's some information here, uh, home insurance, et cetera. So again, it's valuing your customers with new ideas that will save them time. Oops, sorry, let's get out of here. Social, ah, yes, social. Places where I like to go and complain openly. <laughs> Websites like Air Canada. I think that they, they keep trying to take me offline too. They're like, oh, can you, you know, give me a, a can I DM you? I'm like, no, I'm happy to talk about this here. <laughs> and then weird because someone went up to me and my clients afterwards, and I'm slightly embarrassed because it's true. Never put anything on the internet that you don't want to say aloud in a deposition. So I'm always trying to remember that, trying to be nice and diplomatic, but sometimes. And I am actually always respectful, and I demand that of people when they're on, on my pages as well. But social is a big deal. Last year I was talking about how the fact that Facebook now has Messenger in there, where brands are fully, not only doing customer service like the hotels, you can fully book in a lot of them. Go right in, they'll send you tickets, everything right through Messenger. So that's something you might want to look into if you're not doing it for some people on your end. Does it take time? hell of a lot more time than what we're going to get to, which are some bot technology. Because behind this, which is a chat and social, you need someone responding. And people are really angry on social if you don't respond almost instantaneous. Um, and then, because it's public, people start building up. And you really, it's hard to control. It's that Microsoft thing all over again. Microsoft turned its eyes for less than an hour, it became nasty. 24 hours, it became evil. And so this is the thing. So 67% of people have used a medium such as social media. And then if you look, 42% want a response within 60 minutes. 24-7. That's a lot. So you can thank other companies because they've got big call centers and they've bought people on there. And now you're going to have to deal with that. So Facebook, if you probably didn't, they just had their big year, is it eight this year? They're developers conference. And the good news is he, Mark, like I know him as a personal friend, I don't know about Mark, has decided to launch um, a bunch of bots eventually that you guys will be able to tap into to do customer service. Because the small, medium, and even large size business compared to the US has a lot of opportunity. So as I like to say, we're halfway through. Now is when things are going to get hard. And I'm not going to lie to you, some of this you may have seen, because a lot of it you probably haven't. And it's a different way of thinking. Um, I wouldn't be talking to you about bots last year. And this year, I'm all about bots. Uh, that's the title, Bot, Bot, Bot Fuse. And it's not meant to replace anyone in the room. What it is, and the best way someone described it to me, is as we're talking about some of these technologies in the bottom five, these are things that can help you spend more time with the customers that you need to on a one-on-one -on -one basis while facilitating <coughs> happiness on the other. But there is a line in a threshold. So, live chat. Live chat is something that can run inside Facebook. It can run uh, several places, but it is a human on one end. So these, I've listed for you three of the top um, kind of new age chats that you can integrate into your websites and mobile. Um, <coughs> number one is my favorite. It's really smooth because when you're not online, it says, hey, we're not online, but leave us a question. You can type in the question. It comes as an email. Beautifully designed. Takes two seconds of code to put in and run separate. Doesn't change anything on your And it's honestly pennies, pennies, pennies on the dollar. Uh, the other ones are great, but number one is definitely my recommend. But you can also go into Facebook. Now, when you're not there at Facebook, that sucker just hangs. <laughs> That's the problem. So number one, it knows whether you're online or not, and then will default email if you're not. Facebook has yet to do anything. They're going to play more in the bot space. Uh, number one is all human, 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 human. Notifications and SMS. <coughs> so this is huge in Europe. It's just catching on now. And I know some people were talking about being preemptive. 
So helping people remember things is a really good value add. Um, so last year, six months ago, I didn't even know. So I have a Aviva insurance, and I guess I had two brokers, and I don't know why. One for my home and one for my car. And only when something happened to my floor at home did I try to read my account number for the car to her, and she's like, your account isn't here. I'm like, what? I didn't understand what was going on. And so then she said, well, we could move this from, from them to here. And I'm like, well, you've been so helpful with my floor. That sounds like a good idea. And she's like, oh, but that's six months away, but just sign this form. So now my insurance is up now. And I got a note, and I'm like, I don't understand. So NCI, I don't know what's going on. And so my whole point is, if I would have received a text message that said, or even an email, I got nothing, that said, just to let you know, all the paperwork is okay, I moved it over for you, here's your new account, I got nothing. So I have no idea what's going on. Preemptive. And you can do some really beautiful things. So letting people know about claims, letting people, and you're not paying them all the time. You have to ask permission up front, but you can let people know certain things. And people can also opt in for helpful tips, like time to put on your winter tires, time to take off your winter tires, time to you know worry about leaves. People are much more engaged on mobile than email. I have a bunch of uh, mentees. Uh, that I'm their mentor. I've got about 20 kind of brads I'm working with right now, and none of them respond to email. Like, they just don't even check email. Everything's either text message or Slack or some other messaging, or like, WhatsApp, everyone's on WhatsApp. Like, send me a WhatsApp. So, just understand as you do have some younger people coming on to the business, having the ability to choose between communication is really important. Internet of Things, does anyone know what IoT is? few things. Does anyone have it running in their house? Like Alexa, hooked up to your lights, hooked up to like, okay, a few of us. Well, it's getting pretty crazy. Has anyone heard of Hippo? So Hippo is this company, My Hippo, that has decided to win the insurance vertical and recreate the whole, like the whole vertical. They do one thing. They figure out how to get you onboarded in 90 seconds. Then they're going to give you free IoT things through your home, which are like an Alexa, um, a voice activated thing that can do, light bulbs can do all of these things. Which, if you know about that, gathers data, data on your usage, data on everything you do. And then they're going to lower the price point by 25%, because now that they have you, they can actually start integrating into your home and prevent things from happening. They can see when you're running really high on electricity. They can do a lot of these things. Is it crazy? Absolutely. This is a startup. It hasn't launched fully yet. They're coming out. They're like not close to a billion dollars funded, but it's pretty intense on where they are. And so what they're doing is by giving away these free tools, they're able to track things and give you, and they're actually monetizing it. So they'll partner with whoever in energy saving light bulb. They'll partner with different people. So now you can tell me, you know, my lights are on very often, you know, could be dangerous, here's this, or here's a timer when you travel to turn your lights on so people think that you're there. There's a lot of opportunity in this area that's coming, and people are doing a value add, because some of these little things, guys, are like 50 bucks, nothing. But if someone gave that to me, I'm like, that's brilliant. And then now that you can message through it, it's creating a whole new world. Now, we're coming into the bottom one, which are bots. And this is where I'm going to spend the last kind of eight minutes I have quickly getting through things. Because the bot stuff is pretty cool. So I talked about how Mark launched it. He's like all about bots, like last month. Everything we're going to do is going to change. Next insurance is someone you can Google. They nailed down. So they're using bots that are pre-described narratives. What that means is it's kind of like choose your own adventure. So they sat down with all their people and looked at what kind of questions could people ask, and they built a giant tree structure so that when you come online, you can ask a question and you'll get an answer. So what do you have in the way of this insurance? You can start to show you things, videos, all of these things. But the next step for that is artificial intelligence. That means no human, once you script this originally, you are now tapping into someone else's technology that you end up kind of leasing 
and this thing will run itself. And there are people in your industry who specialize in just your vertical for bots to integrate into your experiences. So what does it look like? Let's have a look. <laughs> So you can start to work with these guys, they're in Canada as well, that will start to implement. So you don't, if you haven't done online chat and you don't have a lot of staff, then perhaps it's time to leapfrog. And you can leapfrog right into this. It also means that you can get, when you create these things, that it doesn't always have a dead end. There are points where it can tap to call you, certain things like that. You get complete control over the customer experience. But it's one of those things that people are so used to now, thanks to Google, and Uber, that they want everything instantaneous. So bots are not something to be afraid of. The days of these going off the rail like they did with Microsoft is gone. They're, they're structured somewhat with semantic language, meaning they get limited on what they can say. They're more likely through the AI to try to figure out what you're saying and offer up a solution than they're about to have a whole conversation about something completely inappropriate. So that's the good news, but they're already here in Canada and Ontario, and this is something, if you don't have a lot of manpower, that can save you tons of time by including it on your website with a little dot, someone clicks to chat, and this replaces online chat altogether. Does everyone say fair? <laughs> Lemonade, is that, I'd be investing. <laughs> um, okay, so that's honestly, we're down to the, the, the bottom 10, that's it. Um, KPIs, FAQs, logins, always three, four benefits, remembering that. We wanna make sure that onboarding is easy, top tasks and customer journeys. Those go together, understanding what people wanna do, when they wanna do it, and how they wanna do it. And then from there, you're able to port into the bottom five, which is getting much smarter into online chat thoughts with or without artificial intelligence. Sometimes they're just limited uh, in scope. So that's it. Does anyone have any questions, thoughts, something that didn't make the list? Um, or back to the portal. Just say, just say. Sure. Okay. Really? No. That's really far. Someone uh, uh, in the way? Yeah, yeah. hands up, hands up, thanks. A lot. There we go. Um, going back 
back to the portals. Mm. Uh, if we have implemented the portals a day, how important is it that the portal is real time? Could the request be um, submitted and then dealt with next day and then updated, or is it, does it have to be real time? Well, that is a bit of a loaded question. Depends what the task is. So if I'm coming in to change my address or my credit card, I should be able to see that in real time, right? I should be able to, not the full credit card, you can see the last four digits. I can go in there and change that. I should be able to see, ideally, my policy renewal dates or whatnot. Ideally, be able to click to download. Those are kind of the basics. Now, if it's a, a tougher change of switching like from a two million to five million or something like that, as long as the expectation is managed, you can actually have a couple days. It's when expectations are not managed. So right there it needs to say, you know, if filed on a weekend, it takes two, I usually say two business days, you will get an email confirmation once this has been received, and we will follow up once it's processed. And that time is X to X, right? You need to be very, very specific. And when you say days, you need to say business days. And when you say hours, you need to say what your hours are, eight to six. Like, because otherwise, people are so used to 24-7 that they'll just assume that it should be done. So if I do a quick change and you don't manage that and I get in a car accident, I'm going to say to you, but I sent you something to change that plan. Mm -hmm. So that is how you manage it. And basically, you need to be very clear that your new policy will be in effect when you get an email or text that says your new policy is in effect. So it's not a lot of copy. It's just upfront And letting them know, ideally, that them going through the, the web is the same time as calling in. So if they think that it's because you're not reading messages, it's actually no, it just takes two days to process. Whether you call us or not, it takes two days. This way you have a record. Any other questions? Can you comment? I'll just be loud. Yeah. Can you comment on uh, security? Particularly, you get into Internet of Things and you get into the number one and two areas. At cheap and cheerful apps have a bit of a, a concern around hacking, access to home, things like that. Can you comment a bit about that side? Yeah, Internet of Things and connected car and all of those things. Yeah, I mean, once you're on IP protocol or unit protocol, you're opening yourself. Like, look, we're all still waiting. We've been hacked, for those of you that don't know, the last two days quite significantly. And it only got shut down globally by accident because two 20 year olds found the, the pill switch by accident. So we're waiting for the next round of that to come through Microsoft. It's actually, so just be careful on what you're clicking on over the next couple of days. But Internet of Things does, in fact, yes, open you up. Um, but the technology is getting stronger, faster, smarter. Will we always be ahead of them? <coughs> it's hard to say. I'm not like a security expert. We've had security experts come in and speak to us while creating these things. And you can only do what you can only do. But if some kid in the garage in Russia is going to figure it out, they're going to figure it out. But now just keep in mind, the apps themselves, and just like banking, there's a risk, right? The bank takes on certain risks of me trying not to give out my password. The bank can still get hacked and has been hacked. LinkedIn's been hacked. Everything has happened. So you can do your best security to meet the Canadian regulations, to remind people that it's secure. And then it's more about how you protect them when something goes wrong. So you should have what we have, like I've always had, which is called emergency protocol. So it's written down, if something, if we get hacked, it's literally a list of who gets notified, number one, what do we do, number two, call PR, number three, <laughs> and you work your way down, but everybody knows that you wake Jane up at three and you do this, and the moment you run into a secure interface where someone can see my address or personal information, you should have that emergency cheat sheet. Any other questions? I won't be here next year, it'll be a bot. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't go off the rails. <laughs> All right, well thank you everyone. I think we're gonna just move on.